Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here. Welcome to the Daily Evolver on Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. And I am happy to be here today, joined by Corey DeVos, the Editor-in-Chief of Integral Life. Hey, Corey. Hey, again. How you doing? Good. Good. Good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. And Corey and I are joined by our good friend and my neighbor, Steve McIntosh, who many of you know. Steve has been a longtime friend of the Daily Evolver. And of course, he's one of the leading integral philosophers on the scene today. His latest book is The Presence of the Infinite. And I feel really privileged to know Steve as I do because, uh, you know, we hang out and we talk a lot. We got together last night to talk about this talk and it's just fun being a brother. So Steve, thanks for being here, man. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to see you and Corey too. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to speak with you. Yay. So today, you know, you and I both talk a lot about politics and religion, the two topics you're not supposed to talk about, but uh, today we're going to focus on the spiritual side of the street and, uh, and specifically a teaching that you have developed and um, you, you did a, a, a presentation on it at the Integral Incubator that you and I did in August at the Integral Center here for some people who came in and it was really powerful for me and, and, I, and I loved it. And, and I've learned a lot from you, both in terms of, you know, integral philosophy and helping me understand my way forward, but also in terms of my on the ground spiritual life and practice. And I want to first of all, thank you for that. And then, together. yeah. And then, you know, just to sort of help people understand what I'm talking about it just uh, describe it in, in a minute or so. Uh, what originally grabbed me is your focus on the idea of goodness, truth, and beauty being what you call primary values and these irreducible domains of, of human concern. And as a patterns guy, I really love that because, you know, it's three things that I like that. And, you know, Ken Wilber had talked about that, related it to the um, quadrants. But you, you took it in a, in, a, in a different direction for me. And I, you've worked on it for, you know, like over three books, 20 years or something like that. And, um, and, and of course, and, and I also love how you trace the pedigree of this idea of goodness, truth, and beauty back to Plato and, and show that it's something that philosophers have had a lot of agreement on and, you know, controversy about, but it's a thing. And I, I like that because I'm always looking for the patterns that sort of transcend time and space and culture and so forth. And, and where you have taken me and, and, and wh where you are in your, your latest books, and, and I think of your new book too, is this new territory where these values have a physics, have an energetic quality that allow me to not just understand them, but to access them almost in a bodily way that, uh, you know, just helps me live a better life. It's a spiritual path in and of itself. And I love especially this idea of values gravity, of feeling the pull of goodness, truth, and beauty uh, as, as, as a gravity. And I, I can do that. I can feel that in my karmic stream. You know, what's true? That's a big question and one that is, you know, engaging a lot of people these days. What's good? You know, how do I act? How do I be a good person in this world? And what's beautiful? And, you know, I, I love all that. And, and so then last night we're talking, and uh, we may or may not have been under the influence of substances that are completely legal. In Colorado. <laughs> but you said, you know, well, I'm not so sure about the gravity. I think it's more like electricity. So now I'm all confused. <laughs> but I, I love electricity too, the values of electricity. So anyway. anyway um, I need like to party to, with it, you guys. Yeah, no kidding. That's funny, for sure. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I think, uh, wh why don't you just, first of all, how'd I do? And, you know, uh, why don't you just walk us through your thinking? And, sure. uh, and I've got these, you, you, you've given me seven slides. I can fire them up and I'll interrupt you if you have any questions. But um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you understand this as well as I do. I mean, we're, we've been working on this together and, and the conversations that we've had and the mutual teachings that we've done has helped bring it out and make it more pragmatic. 
uh, I guess this topic, we, you know, we're, we're categorizing it as spiritual and philosophical, and indeed it is, uh, but it's directly related to political. In other words, I've been developing this idea of, of value and, and virtue and spiritual energy and spiritual gravity and, and these related concepts that we're trying to relate to physics, but which of course transcend physics, uh, is that we're in dark times, right? And as you have mentioned in many of your recent blogs uh, or podcasts, the, 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 our notion of the good is shifting under our feet. And in these dark times, uh, gaining a greater knowledge of the good, kind of coming to understand it more clearly, regaining a sense of higher purpose and a sense of hope for progress. Uh, and, and that, you know, that we're not going to be in a regressive mode uh, indefinitely. Uh, it, it puts a premium on an understanding of the good that can uh, rekindle our hope and optimism and, uh, potentially our national solidarity. So there are political implications. For are you this. referring to Donald Trump by any chance? Well, he, you know, I, I try not to mention his name because he, he wants us to just talk about him all the time. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it, it's a law now, isn't it, that we have to talk about him? About him. <laughs> the, the darkness can't be personified with just one person, but certainly he's a big part of it. Yeah, fair enough. So, um, yeah, so, you know. So, so, so uh, this idea of the good, or what is the good, or how could we reclaim, uh, how could we come to a higher uh, uh, transcendent notion of, of what this means? Of course, you know, the good has been the subject of some of the best uh, thinkers in humanity for thousands of years. And there's a, a giant amount of literature and philosophy and psychology and you know, ethics developed uh, in this area. So, I mean, certainly the beautiful, the true, and the good, and virtue ethics, these are ideas that we've inherited, you know, from history. But I think that with the, with the emergence of the integral perspective, we come to see things that we couldn't see before, even though they were all around us, even though they were obvious. We can conceive of them in a new way and work with them, harness these truths and these, these forms of, of spiritual energy, if you will. So, for example, the idea of energy, uh, physical energy, the physics of energy, is surprisingly new. Even though lightning bolts and sunlight and heat have been around you know, throughout humanity's history, it wasn't until the 19th century that people began to think in terms of energy as a concept. We take it for granted now. But the development of the physics of energy that was one of the gifts of modernist consciousness led directly to highly pragmatic electronic technologies, which have now, of course, transformed the world. Well, you can kind of see how that's yeah. true. I mean, the idea of uh, energy to modernists, it's something that wasn't necessarily seen before. I mean, it was well, literally not seen. Yeah. And even though it was all there all along, it yes. took modernist consciousness to, to get that aha moment and to be able to see that magnetism and electricity and light, these are gravity. all spectrum and uh, well, gravity is a separate force, but still there are these four major forces. I mean, the physics of energy have been highly developed since the 19th century, but uh, Emerson was really insightful for recognizing that every natural fact is a shadow or a symbol of some higher spiritual fact. And certainly physical energy is uh, one of the most fundamental natural facts of the universe. And the fact that it may be pointing to the nature of something more spiritual, but that is akin to it, uh, is an intriguing idea that I've been exploring. And I've been thinking about it in these terms, in terms of gravity or an attractor of eros or uh, a metabolism of spiritual energy for a long time in my work. But as I've been working on this politics book that I'm working on, I got to a realization that there was another piece of it, and that is the virtues, which I didn't really quite understand before or fully appreciate how the, the systematic energy-like nature of virtues fits perfectly with the systematic energy-like nature of the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, and how these things are, are related. So let's go to the first slide. Yeah, I just put it up. Right, okay. Um, so many integralists, I would say most of your uh, listeners here, are familiar with this triad, this ancient triad that was first, uh, uh, well, at least could be traced back to Plato. It's known as the Platonic triad of goodness, truth, and beauty. 
And although any philosophy of values has been fragmented by postmodernism, right? Like Michel Foucault didn't recognize the good, the true, and the beautiful as the primary values. But this notion has been reclaimed in a lot of integral discourse. And uh, it's been something that I've been working with for 20 years. The idea is that, that the good by itself really is, is, can't be understood. One, the concept or word of goodness can't hold all the meaning that we try to, to put into it. And the first step in trying to show how it's bigger than one word can, can capture is by seeing how the good is in a system or in a, in a permanent dynamic relationship with the beautiful and the true. In other words, the, the beautiful and the true are like the legs of goodness. You know, beauty is the yin aspect of goodness. It's a sort of perfection at rest. It's just something beautiful. It's already, you know, showing the faint traces of perfection, right? Hmm. But, but even no matter how beautiful our world or our situation may be, there's always, it's always partial. There's always more. And so truth is that yang element of searching, you know, that, but, but for truth to be a value and not just a fact, it has to bend toward goodness. So there's a whole philosophy uh, the idea that these values are primary, like um, just like three primary colors on your computer screen, RGB, you know, are making up the full spectrum. Uh, there's been many arguments that in Evolution's Purpose, my 2012 book, it took me 40 pages to make the argument that the good, the true, and the beautiful really are the most intrinsic forms of value that we can understand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, beyond this kind of proposition, of the good, the true, and the beautiful being the primary values. Even these words, even as a systemic understanding of how they're co-creating each other uh, is inadequate. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Hang on. This is cool. Okay, uh, there we go. And we go to the next slide, right? That's one number one still. Yep. Okay, here's the number two. So we have a word cloud here. And what this is illustrating is that the words goodness, beauty, and truth are really labels for entire dimensions of value, right? Goodness, in a sense, being the moral dimension, beauty, the aesthetic dimension, truth, the rational dimension. And we see how all these different words. Uh, so moral, moral, moral aesthetic, aesthetic, and rational. Rational. Okay. Now, there's overlap, and there's, you know, we can't get too... Um, uh, 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 specific. I mean, the, the, right. the words, again, we're, we're trying to, the, the thing that we're talking about transcends being captured by language in the same way that electricity can't be captured. It, it's a flowing, dynamic, you know, free, thrilling, always moving thing. And if we begin to understand that what we're talking about here is spiritual energy, it has behaviors, it has a kind of a physics, it has these energetic properties. But when we try to capture it and make it stand still with words or concepts, it, it's just a, a shadow of what it is that we're trying to capture. So the word cloud idea begins to get to some of this. But another way that we can begin to get an inkling of how spiritual energy is moving in, in as sort of a, a, a perfecting circuit uh, is to go to the next slide, slide three. Yeah, this shows how the good, the beautiful, and the true are practiced through a kind of metabolism, a value metabolism, right? The most obvious way of thinking about this is, is the truth. If you see the, the circle on the, on the left there, learning and teaching, right? That is, you never really learn something until you've had a chance to teach it. To it's really it through, yeah. To, 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 you know, when, when, um, you know, when you take a test in school, in a way, it's a way of teaching that which you've learned, and it kind of encircles it through you, and it gives, it, gives you possession of it in a more permanent way. And in the same way that, that truth is, is the practice of it is through this metabolism of its energy by learning and teaching, beauty is the same way. And, and here I've got the labels appreciating and creating. Um, the, the analogy I usually use is that if an artist wants to paint a sunset, she has to look at the sunset and feel, it's not only see the details of it, but also feel its majestic quality to really capture it, you know, in paint. And so the act of appreciate, the act of, of trying to create or reproduce the beauty of a sunset helps her appreciate it with new depth and clarity. And so the idea that, that beauty is a form of spiritual energy, no matter what we do to create beauty, whether it's painting a picture or 
just beautifying our homes, that act of creating beauty opens the aperture for us to receive more beauty of every kind, right? So that this idea of metabolism is illustrated by these circles. And in the same way that truth is practiced or metabolized by learning and teaching and beauty by appreciating and creating, goodness, uh, you know, the central or the, you know, the sort of perfection's plumb line, if you will, the most, the most the word which comes the closest to naming this thing as a unity uh, is, is, can be understood loosely through this metabolism of what I call devotion and service, right? So service is a general way of thinking about how you teach goodness or create goodness, right? And, and that which is you're most devoted to, whether it's your family or, you know, nature or the environment, whatever the concept of, you know, the transcendent, that which you've laid down your life for, that's in a sense how goodness enters into your consciousness and empowers your service, right? It, yeah. Just like when you learn something that you're really enthusiastic about, you're, you can't wait to teach it or to share it. The same when it comes to this, where, where the spiritual energy of goodness enters through our devotions and is manifest or, or lived out uh, through our service. Now, yeah. now so, as I look at this, I can see that, well, first of all, there's six things that I ought to be doing. Learning, teaching, devotion, service, appreciating, and creating. And I could see that I'm really heavy on the learning and teaching part. Uh, the devotion and service, uh, you know, devotion, I could work on, you know. Appreciating, creating beauty, yeah, I'm pretty good with that, but a little low on the creation side. Yeah. So, you know, it really helps me to sort of true myself up a little bit. Well, it's kind of hokey to talk about it in these terms, but these really are the, the major food groups of spiritual nutrition. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, but, but, okay, so I've been teaching this stuff about the beautiful, true, and the good since 2007, since my Integral Consciousness book came out. But the part that I want to add uh, is, is how the part of what gave me an inkling that when we're talking about the beautiful, the true, and the good, these aren't static platonic forms. Um, they're not so much, they're not, you know, adjectives like something's good or right. even a noun like something is, you know, good, like the good. They're more verbs. You know, the good is as the good does. And, and that is a sense, gives us a sense of, of, of thinking about it like electricity more than matter. Uh, and and what, what began to kind of open my eyes to how to break out of the, 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 the seeming conceptual dry abstractness of this and, and bring it alive so that people want to jump out of their chairs and, and also show the, how it's politically potent, how it can really be applied directly to our you know, current life conditions. Um, I've gone to this next step, which I want to share now if you'll go to the next slide. Okay, cool. All right. And I do that same thing. And then I push that button. And then I push this other button over here. Next one. Yep. And there we are. So, here we go. so this is that same circle we saw before of devotion and service as the way of metabolizing goodness. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like, for example, in the, uh, the, the science and sociology of, of teaching, of the pedagogy, it's been extremely well worked out, different learning styles, different techniques. The, the details of how to do learning and teaching are extremely well developed. And as it turns out, the details of how to do the metabolization of goodness energy is worked out through this ancient concept of, concept of the virtues. Hmm. Now, at first, I didn't get virtue ethics. I didn't understand what the appeal was. It seemed kind of too earnest, you know, or Pollyanna, like we should just be virtuous, like it was sort of this almost moralistic and priggish. I didn't understand that it was anything but just a, a traditional... Well, it's, uh, it's, it's quaint language. You know, it's kind of Victorian in the virtues. Right, right. So it seems kind of uh, amber or, or yeah. traditional yeah. You know, in, its, in its nature, right? Yeah. But just like uh, uh, we, we, uh, this integral perspective has allowed us to take a fresh look at all kinds of uh, elements of our past history, um, I'm taking a fresh look at virtues, and, I, and I'm, the more integralists I talk to about it and in our, our seminar it was well received, people could see how, wow, this is immediately applicable. Yeah. So just like we used a word cloud to describe goodness, truth, and beauty, even though those are words that stand still and that, you know, they, they serve as the most intrinsic labels, they still stand for this whole field. 
And, and those words attach to this field like iron filings to a magnet, you know, so we have to kind of be translinguistic in our approach to it. The same comes with the virtues. So let's go to the next slide. All right. And so inside, you know, goodness, we have this word cloud of virtues, right? And these seven that I have here in bold are the traditional virtues handed down from Catholicism, but they're also based on the genius of Aristotle and Plato and, and uh, Thomas Aquinas. So there's a sort of a, 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 a ancient pedigree that identifies these seven words with the most intrinsic virtues or the, the cardinal virtues. And even though these words aren't, aren't always uh, uh, used, they, they serve as a kind of a foundation for the modern revival of virtue ethics, which is getting a lot of traction in professional philosophy, mm -hmm. as well as in the field of positive psychology. Uh, many listeners may be familiar with Martin Seligman and his work. Even though Seligman is a materialist and a behaviorist, uh, he nevertheless has his version of the virtues, and they're almost identical to, to this, except that he's got a little allergy regarding the the, the faith and the hope. But as I'll explain here in a second, um, even those have a secular expression. They don't have to be religious in nature, mm -hmm. even though they're certainly from uh, mm -hmm. the Christian tradition. So let me yeah, just... Well, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I have faith in emergence. There you go. Yeah, yeah well, and scientists have faith that the universe is intelligible and yeah. that, you know, what, what's true... I have, I have that faith, yeah. too. <laughs> so, so, okay, so let me just go through these quickly. All right. Uh, starting with love there on the right. Now, certainly I, I think most people will agree that love is arguably the most important virtue that in, if, if the, the virtues have any kind of unity, then love might be the one word, just like goodness names the values, love might name the virtues, but love can also name something bad and love can be out of control. It can lead people, you know, not to spiritual growth. I mean, that's a whole philosophical riff on itself, but I'll say that and say, that love is certainly a thing we can agree on as important and spiritual and virtuous. But love, as you move around the circle here, connects to this idea of justice or fairness, right? Um, that, that, in other words, even though you love someone, there's still a necessity for working out the distances between self and other. Otherwise, you have codependence, right? This is a, a, Aristotle. Whose, whose work on the virtues is perhaps the most prominent and still very influential to this day, talked about the unity of virtues and the balance of the virtues, how the, 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 every virtue is a balance between two extremes, hmm. and the virtues themselves uh, can balance each other and, and moderate and correct each other. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, so love leads to justice, which also might be termed fairness. Mm -hmm. And then this archaic term temperance, which doesn't necessarily mean sobriety. It's a, a better term might be self-mastery. Yeah. Because temperance is kind of an unusual word and you don't really know what it means. It's useful because it helps you explore this as a virtue because it's not just self-mastery. There's more to it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the moving around the circle, this goes to prudence, which has also been translated as strategic wisdom. But, but prudence is a necessary virtue. You can't just be completely selfless. You have to be a, a strategic but not in a selfish way, because prudence alone uh, can become vice-ish or vicious. Prudence, likewise, uh, can, can lead you to the virtue of courage, right, which has also been translated as fortitude. And then that moves up towards the higher virtues of hope, which is more than just optimism. Optimism is like a bet, you know, that things will be better. But hope is more active. It's, it's, it, you know, you're more engaged when you're hoping. And so these words, even though we could parse them, and again, we have a word cloud that goes around them, and people could substitute other words, labels in this field. Mm -hmm. but, there, but the more you think about this and work with this, I'm just introducing it here, but, the, but there is a, a systematic way these things relate to each other. A system. Right. Well, I can see it in my own, um, in my own life. The... Um... You know, people always say you're so optimistic, and I never really love that because I don't, you know, wow. I don't see myself that way. Wow. I actually see myself as, um, you know, realistic. Who and, and 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 I'm taking into account the fact that there is a unfolding towards goodness, truth, and beauty that is completely discernible in human history, and um, and I have some faith that that's going to continue, and hopefully will outrun the, you know, the the 
the catastrophes that are in our wake, you know. Right. Uh, and I, I, I don't have complete faith that that's true. I really don't. But I have some hope that that's true. And then that sort of takes me down to courage. And, I, I, you know, I could sort of, you know, work my way around this circle in a way that helps me sort of sort out, you know, how to be a better person. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's not entirely obvious, and it can't be understood in a, in a completely superficial way, because it takes, you have to work it. In other words, to understand what it means to practice the virtue of hope, you know, courage and prudence and love, these other, these other virtues have to be engaged. And the thing is, is that, that one of the arguments that the virtue ethicists make is that these are actually technologies for happiness. Hmm. That, that these are that, that that for example positive psychology employs the virtues because it's really found that if you want to be happy happiness is a byproduct of virtuous behavior if you try to pursue happiness by itself it rarely delivers or happens right I know. but but if if these these elements of of this practice of goodness you know, they're they're channels or circuits of spiritual energy who's practice in your life, uh, both together and individually. And, you know, if, if, if goodness, truth, and beauty are in a sense headings or directions, like how do we make things more evolved or make them more good, more true, and more beautiful? If they're directions, the virtues are, are, are like habits, you know, habits of the heart. You know, they're, they're practices which you sort of fall back on because they're who you are. You know, they, they come to form the substance of your being. So they're not just actions, they're not just doings. They're actually, they, they mold your character in a way that, that, that you're habituated to be loving or faithful mm -hmm. or, or just mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. and fair. And by being virtuous in this way, you're not, it's not because you're trying to please some, you know, guilt mongering deity. It's because you're, because you recognize that this is what it means to channel spiritual energy and channeling mm -hmm. spiritual energy is what's gonna make you happy. It's what's going to create evolution in nature, self, and culture. And it's what right. it always has. We're coming to see it in a new way. So, yeah. No, I can see it. And I can also, you know, just this formulation in and of itself helps me to ask myself, so where am I not being loving? Where am I not being just? Where am I not being temperate? Right. You know, there's, there's answers to all those questions. I can go around prudent. Where am I not being courageous? Yeah. You know, where am I not being hopeful? And actually, where have I lost faith? You know, and, and how can I regain it? There's a lot of people, you know, green in general sort of has lost faith in a way, you know, that sort of postmodern malaise that a lot of our, you know, friends are, you know, knee deep in, neck deep in. Right. Well, for many people, faith is a dirty word because they think it's belief without evidence or something. But that's not what faith is about. Faith is about this, uh, this commitment to the universe being good, this commitment to the transcendent object of your devotion, whatever that mm -hmm. might be, that that really is bigger than yourself, mm -hmm. and that by serving it, you really can serve yourself. And that's, that's a key point I want to get to next, Okay. how, how these things connect in a circuit, how, how the systemicity or, or the way that these partake of spiritual energy becomes more obvious as we unpack the, the philosophical insights here. So, okay. Should we so go to the next, next slide? Yeah, next slide's really quick, and then we'll go straight to the to this last slide. Okay. So here we are back. We've talked about these seven virtues, but we know that these word labels are just, you know, placeholders for some larger field that we need a word cloud to try to populate, and that they might be somewhat different for everyone, but there is some objective quality to the nature of virtue and how it balances it. We may be far from coming to an objective understanding of it, you know, philosophically as a, as a species, but I think with an integral perspective and with the power of integral philosophy, we get to know more about it, and, and that can be very helpful to our current situation. Let's go to the last slide. Okay, so here we have the familiar circle of the seven virtues you know, in this kind of dynamic flowing relationship. But on the right, I show what I'm calling these obligations of ethical duty. I mean, the virtues are, are called ethics or virtue ethics because each one has a, a sort of a, a focus or an object, right? And most people think about the virtues as, or ethics in general, as being what your duty is to other people. But virtue ethics as a philosophical field of understanding 
recognizes, ever since Aquinas, it's been recognized that, that there are, you do have an ethical duty to yourself, and that both the, the virtues of both temperance or self-mastery and prudence or strategic wisdom, that those virtues are really, they have the self as their object. And, and then you can't just be completely selfless or you lose your power to insert spiritual energy, right? Likewise, we can see how justice and courage, you know, have other people as their primary object, although we can see overlap between the different objects. But, but certainly you want to be just with other people, but it's also the threats of other people and their, their machinations that cause us to have to be courageous and to stand up, you know, for what's right. But here we come to this concept of the transcendent at the top. And by the transcendent, I'm not necessarily talking about God, right, or ultimate reality. The transcendent is whatever you'd be willing to lay down your life for, whatever is bigger than you in a way that, that it extracts your devotion. Right? And so certainly that, that we can have many objects of transcendence, right? Certainly my kids, my sons, you know, I'd lay down my life for them. Um, you know, the humanity as a whole, if it came between me and humanity, I think it would be a worthy sacrifice, right? Um, that, that, that even in our secular age, where many people have, have lost this concept of, of a God or even an ultimate reality as some transcendent object of their devotion, there's ways that the transcendent can be reclaimed at a, perhaps a lower level, but still stands in and does the same work as being a source of spiritual energy. Right, so not only has it been things like the environment, it's been um, uh, you know, sometimes there's been substitute transcendence that haven't been transcendent enough, like you know uh, the the German Volk or the proletariat, right, or or other other substitute transcendence. I mean, some people think of art as their transcendent object, or baseball or something. And if if it works as a source of spiritual energy, I don't want to poo poo it or or uh, uh, diminish its function that way. I mean, in other words, whatever can be transcendent, whatever bigger than self thing you can find yourself devoted to, then that's what's going to help channel spiritual energy for you wherever you are in your spiritual world. So, okay, let, let, let me stop you there. Yeah. So I get that. I just let me see if I could paraphrase it a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, to the degree that I am this, you know, skin encased Jeff, solid thing and i'm working on my own uh uh, uh happiness my own um well-being the my own <laughs> grandeur uh <clears throat> that's that is the road to misery and actually i happen to have lived a period of my life where i got the opportunity to just you know work on myself and it was the most miserable time of my life. Uh, and I wasn't happy again until I got back out into the world and started working and serving, you know. And um, so, so then anything that's going to take us outside of this self is going to be aerating spiritual energy one way or the other. I mean, it's just going to, whether it's our kids, whether it's a, 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 some sort of cause. And uh, to the degree that we can... And, you know, breathe that in and, and you know, as I say, aerate uh, ourself with that. That is what you're calling the spirit, spiritual energy. Well, in a way, if I could just make one final point on this and you can go back to that slide, the final slide. The, the idea that it's a circuit, again, every one of these concepts evokes a circuit metaphor, right, of energy. And um, we, we, ha we have this circuit that can be seen between the self and the transcendent that necessarily goes through other people. In other words, the, the, if, if we're just focusing on the transcendent and it's so idealistic that there's nothing we can really do, there's no way we can serve it, then this circuit of, of devotion and service can't be engaged, right? But, and likewise, if we're just concerned with the self, then we can get burned out because there's, the, there's no energy circuit connected. But when we connect the circuit of the self-interest with a greater than self transcendent interest. And that service makes a difference in the world, primarily through other people or, you know, the environment or something, you know, that's, that's, uh, that is the object of justice, for example, then we can begin to understand how there is a, we, we hook up this channel of spiritual energy. It gives us motivation. It gives us purpose power. It gives us the ability to do things and to see things we couldn't see 
if we weren't engaging this spiritual energy to, to make our consciousness more alive. And so that's how this, this um, you know, the somewhat musty, you know, or earnest concept of, of, of virtue ethics can be brought alive when we connect it to the larger idea of spiritual energy and see how it, and it works in a system with the beautiful, the true, and the good uh, to, um, uh, to make the world a better place. Now, the political implications of this is that just like the, we, this new understanding of the physics of, of, of physical energy led to technology, electronic technologies, my argument is that our new understanding of spiritual energy can lead to political technology, social technologies, social medicine that can help build political will, that can restore a sense of higher purpose, common purpose, you know, for, our, uh, for, for the world, for America, for, you know, for all of us, that, that this isn't just some idealistic speculation, that it reaches all the way down to the ground in some powerful, and intriguing ways. And the dark times that we're in right now, in a sense, are, are I, I think, making this, the need for this, or the ability to recognize this more, more evident than ever. In other words, we need this now more than ever. Yeah, no, I like that. That doesn't come through in a, in a clearer and better way than it ever has before. Yeah. No, I like that. And it's, uh, it really does help me to, you know, as I said, have a more on-the-ground spiritual practice where I can check in with these things and see, you know, how am I doing? And Am I too much self? Am I too much other people? Or am I too much transcendent? Because uh, yeah. I've been all three of those uh, yeah. at different times in my life. Sure. And um, so, yeah, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we got this done in uh, less than 40 minutes. Just yeah. like well, there's certainly a lot more to say. But that's that's a certain enough to chew on, I think, for folks. Yeah. Yeah, Corey, any thoughts on this or um, any comments, any comments from, from folks? Yeah, I, well, I, I haven't seen any comments come up, but I, I, I guess I do have a question for you, Steve. Um, and, you know, I, I, let me preface by this question by saying I know you're not necessarily a strict Wilberian in terms of how you think about these things, but I really enjoy sort of the, the symmetry that I see between what Ken writes about and what you write about. So you learned a lot and appreciate yeah. your work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and it's, of course, this is, this is great. I love seeing this sort of Cambrian explosion of integral ideas going out there. And um, I, I think it's wonderful. And I, I, I really uh, appreciate your work here. Um, so often when Ken talks about the good, the beautiful, and the true, he uses them as a sort of a distillation of the four quadrants, right? So in other words, one of Ken's, I think, greatest insights that he's contributed is this idea that the universe is actually not fundamentally composed of atoms or quarks or strings or even holons. It's actually fundamentally composed of perspectives. And he posits that the four quadrants is sort of as as distilled of a version of, of as distilled of a way of talking about these perspectives as we can get and so we've got the four quadrants and then we've got the good the beautiful and the true and often what ken does is say well the right hand quadrants the upper right and the lower right the systems and the behavioral it, we can both call that the true so there's a critic uh one of ken's critics name is joe corbett and I don't, I don't feel like I can fully represent his view here, but he makes the case that in addition to the good, the beautiful, and the true, we should actually add a term that better captures the lower right quadrant. And he suggests justice. And I was, you know, it sparked me because I saw that you include justice in sort of that circuit of goodness. And, and I, you know, I certainly- well, The, the cardinal virtues. I mean, that's just not me. That's, you know, Plato. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, I can, I can see where Joe's coming from here because any notion of justice, for example, sort of requires both goodness and the ability to discern truth. In other words, you can't execute justice unless you actually have a sensible understanding of what the circumstances are. So it's not, justice is something that can't really be removed from truth or it can't be, it's, it's not, it can't be seen as mutually exclusive from truth. There's some overlap there. Right. Now, I, I personally think that justice isn't sort of a big enough virtue to cover the lower right quadrant, but I can sort of see where Joe's coming from here. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any response to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can see how it, it is a useful exercise to maybe see how in each quadrant we might 
rec recognize a dominant, um, one of the primaries like beauty or, or truth and try to label those on the quadrants. But I also think there's ways in which they defy being so easily categorized quadrant wise, mm -hmm. partially because um, they, they, they kind of like we, we say truth is the objective, right? It's on the right hand side. But truth is inside of our minds. It's, it's, it's a concept that's, that's internal. You know, truth yeah. is a mental thing. So it's, it's subjective in its being, right? Yeah. Likewise, beauty, is, we say it's subjective. So it's on the left-hand side. But beauty is the most visible part of goodness in the world, right? Something's beautiful. That's in the world. So it's in some ways more objective than truth, which is more subjective. So they, they kind of cross over. Yeah. So I don't want to sort of just leave beauty over there and truth over there. Another way of thinking about them is that those arrows in the four quadrants are moving. The beautiful, the true, and the good are really one thing, and the directions in each quadrant is a different version of that one thing, right? They're all moving toward the good. Evolution is moving. Again, it's, it's, it's not a growth to goodness fallacy, right? This is not that, 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 that all life is striving to survive and reproduce, which is a kind of primitive goodness. And as humans awaken to a whole new uh, a spectrum of values, a whole new dimension of values, it continues to attract the eros of consciousness and culture. So the good, the true, and the beautiful are, are instead of dividing them and labeling them, you know, one to each quadrant, I would say each quadrant has their own version of all three, which are really one thing. But we could, when we try to language it, yeah. we end up with word clouds that I can yeah. try to understand. Right. Right? Um, I can also say that justice is not only one of the virtues, it's also kind of a subspecies of goodness. Mm -hmm. In the word cloud for beauty, truth, and goodness, justice is certainly up there in the moral dimension. Um, you know, and I'm glad that, all, you know, when anybody tries to write and think about integral philosophy, uh, I'm, I'm happy for it. I want to be inviting, but um, I haven't really um, found much of interest in um, Joe Colbert's work. Mm. Great. Well, that's, that's a great response. And I actually love how you're saying how each quadrant sort of has its own good, beautiful, and true. And I would also say the good and beautiful and the true, each of those has its own four quadrants. Well, sure. I mean, you know, we, we can, the, the maps can be melded. We can have, uh, we can kind of speculate about this and, and think about it systematically. Mm -hmm. But it's also important, just like I was trying to step back from the language. And so we don't want to get fixated on good, true, beautiful. It's like we're, the language is like iron filings. But there's also something that, that it's, if we're really going to understand it as humanity, we're going to have to develop an understanding that's not, that, that connects to language, but isn't necessarily grounded at that level, right? Yeah. And so the same thing when it comes to systems, systems of quadrants, systems of values or virtues, I think that, that exploring the neosphere, if you will, or, or the structure of emergence, evolutionary emergence, that this is like, just like the Renaissance began with a great mapping of the world, we're mapping the structure of emergence. We're using all these different angles, right? But there's no one model, I would argue, that can adequately capture culture. You know, we need quadrants, we need levels, lines, types. I mean, you know, Ken's been very good about that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that, especially when it comes to politics, trying to map culture, I like worldviews the best as a cultural map, but there's other angles too that might even contradict that map. And we need to have a sort of tolerance for ambiguity and internal contradiction if we're going to be able to even get a, uh, an inkling of what it is that we're trying to uh, uh, map, what the territory really is, because it's a uh, fourth dimensional territory, right? right. No, no thing. more ambiguity. <laughs> I'm, I'm done I with want some face. <laughs> Evolving minds want to know. <laughs> so thank you, Steve. You're so smart. Well, thank you, Jeff. You are too, and so are you, Corey. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, so, totally, Corey. That was so good to sort of bring those together. And yeah, I really appreciate it. So, uh, yeah. So, thanks so much, uh, Steve McIntosh. Uh, people can find out more of your stuff at what? Well, my my author website is stevemcintosh.com, and the headquarters for my political work is the Institute for Cultural Evolution Think Tank, which I uh, have with uh, Carter Phipps and, and you and, and John Mackey, and, and we have this integral political think tank, and that's at culturalevolution.org, and people can cool. uh, read about the latest stuff there. All righty. Okay, folks, thanks so much. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow again for another episode of The Daily Evolver. <laughs> Bye, folks. Bye, guys.